Good morning. I just want you to know that um, I'm here today to share with you my students' work. You'll have a chance to see what we do at the High School for Recording Arts. I didn't come to this work as an educator. I was an entertainment lawyer. I'm a product of 1970s New York. It was dirty, it was grimy, things were changing. Arts was coming out of education at the time, and it was really a struggle to, to really kind of figure out you know, how do you express yourself? And out of that came the incredible phenomenon of hip hop. So I was there. Um, I tell my students a story. I, uh, I tell them like, um, and it's, it's mostly true. Um, <laughs> I was at a party for, in, during Christmas. It was a basement party. And during the time, it was like all this funk music and disco and everything. It's the 1970s. And, this kid got this stereo, this brand new stereo, because um, it was just after Christmas and it was in the basement and um, everything was fine except that he had this plug that you could plug into the stereo and it had a mic attached to it. So as the music's playing, he's saying all this stupid stuff on the mic over the music. And you know, we're dancing, you know, we're doing our thing um, and everybody's like, shut up. You know, you're, mess you're messing up the music. But Little by little, each person would try to get the mic because they want to hear their voice through the speakers because we had never experienced that. So here it is, all through the party, people are grabbing this mic and trying to express themselves through it to be a part of this music and to be a part of this energy. And I, although we felt it was extremely annoying because no one was saying anything that made any kind of sense, it was just like, you know, just crazy stuff. Um, the next morning, I remember going to my mother and saying to her, Mom, I want to get that stereo where you, where you could put the, the plug in and you have the mic. And from there, all the parties started being that way. So from that, um, I went to law school, and I decided that by that time, all of my friends who had come up through this incredible phenomenon of hip-hop were now going into the industry and creating music and creating businesses became a multi-billion dollar worldwide phenomenon. And during that time, I, was, I met this guy who came from um, Minnesota to a music conference in New York. And um, he was a rapper. And he told me he grew up with Prince and was rapping with Prince. I was like, really? I mean, by then, like this is like the 1990s. Prince was just huge. And I, I was really just trying to be a groupie. But, uh, <laughs> So I became his friend. He didn't know that was really what my intent was. So, so he started flying me out to uh, Minnesota and hanging out at Paisley Park. It was just, uh, you know, an incredible time creatively in that sense. But um, when Prince changed his name to a symbol, because he had a contract with Prince with Warner Brothers. When Prince changed his name to a symbol um, to get out of his contract with Warner Brothers, because in his mind, if... Uh, if the symbol exists and Prince doesn't, there's no contract anymore, right? A novel legal theory. So anyway, da David lost his contract with Prince at the time, and as a result, he wanted to open up his own recording studio. And he asked me to help him do it. And we called it Studio Four. And over time, we were just trying to rent out studio time and trying to find the next big recording artist. But instead, young people were showing up every single day wanting to know how to get their music out, wanting to know how to um, um, you know, just become a part of something that they knew was so in intrinsically important to them. But we would look at our watch, it would be like 12 o'clock in the afternoon, and we were like, why aren't you guys in school? They were like, forget school. We're not going to school. We got kicked out, we got pushed out. Uh, they don't want us, it's not relevant, it's boring. And David had the incredible idea to start the school at the studio. And we created the High School for Recording Arts. And from that, um, and that was 1998, the original young people were, had dropped out. Most were involved in the criminal justice system. Many were homeless, all of them were poor. And to this day in 2016, going from 15 students to 325 students, that is still the population we serve. Yet, we don't talk about that. Those statistics I just told you has 
no part in our conversation because what we focus on is their genius. And I just want to show a clip. Is it possible to show the Sam Seidel clip? So um, is the commercial? Can a commercial go? Okay, let's try the commercial. Hey everyone, if you're a high school student who's interested in audio engineering, producing, or singing, you name it, we got it. High School for Recording Arts, a place where you design your education. Think about it, science, technology, aviation, and basketball in our new Jump City courts. To learn more, visit us in person or on our website at hsra.org. HSRA, design your own education and be the real you. Part of our promotion is to, you know, we, we, we advertise to our community because we want people, to, you know, young people to know and families to know what we do. And it's an incredible commercial and it's totally produced by our students. And I just wanted to have that as just a beginning um, a statement as to, you know, what I'm here to talk to you about in terms of what young people can do. This is all about what young people can do when you give them a chance irrespective of their background, irrespective of whatever kind of obstacles, us focusing on their brilliance. So um, doing this work, I met a young man um, named Sam Seidel. And um, he and some others and I were doing some work around the country in national reform, and we realized we had this um, um, connection through hip hop. And from that, we started talking about hip hop as pedagogy and and you know, what does it, how should it really look in the school? What does it mean to teach hip hop as opposed to you know, taking it on to a more authentic level? And we created this uh, kind of, really was just a talking group called Hip Hop Genius. And out of that, Sam moved to Minnesota from um, Providence, Rhode Island and spent about a year and a half and wrote a book about our school called Hip Hop Genius. But everything I've said up to this point, I think, can be captured in this video. And anybody, do anybody here know Sam Seidel and Hip Hop Genius? So most of the room does not. Okay, great. So let's get that going. When I was 20 years old, I started teaching at a juvenile prison. While there were many things that separated us, I quickly discovered my students and I had one big thing in common, our love of hip hop. For the next few years, rap music became the main content for the classes I taught, and I saw disengaged students emerge as leaders and experts. Through engaging elements of hip hop culture together, students and I learned language arts, life skills, and to love each other and ourselves more. As I continue to observe the ways in which our education system is rigged against black and Latino students and students from low-income communities, I asked myself what else we as educators could learn from hip-hop, the insanely innovative and influential global phenomenon that has emerged from those very same communities. When I say hip-hop, I'm not just talking about music or music, graffiti, and dance, which are considered its central elements. I'm referring to the blend of instincts, confidence, and ingenuity that develops in oppressed communities as has been demonstrated through the evolution of hip-hop culture. I'm talking about a Jamaican teenager in the South Bronx taking two records of the same song and fading back and forth between them to create a new musical composition by playing the most danceable segment over and over. I'm talking about aspiring visual artists realizing they didn't need galleries to represent them for their work to be seen, and instead painting on train cars and instantly having an audience of hundreds of thousands. I'm talking about a high school dropout from the projects of Marcy, using his entrepreneurial hustle and rap skills to go from selling drugs, to selling CDs out of the trunk of his car, to selling products at Macy's. This is what my colleagues and I call hip-hop genius, creative resourcefulness in the face of limited resources, or as it is often said in the hip-hop community, flipping something out of nothing. How can this audacious approach impact our education system? For starters, we need to exhibit the brash creativity of hip-hop's pioneers, just as hip-hop producers sampled songs from other genres creating unique new sounds to please audiences' ears, hip-hop educators can borrow from diverse models and improvise innovative blends of educational practices customized to meet students' needs. If that sounds too abstract, take a look at the High School for Recording Arts in Minnesota, where they've mixed project-based learning and competency-based assessment with artistic, vocational, and business training with dual enrollment at local colleges with a heavy dose of student leadership. We don't have to do the same thing that's been done before or follow one model. We can sample and mix multiple teaching techniques and school designs to find the blends that best serve our students. We also need to adopt the value hip-hop places on staying fresh. A hot beat yesterday was 
a hot beat yesterday. Whoever sets out to make a hot beat today has to do something new and different to remain relevant. The world is changing rapidly around us. The top 10 jobs in 2010 didn't exist six years earlier. Hip hop's premium on freshness must permeate our schools. And we need to be resourceful. In the 1970s, thousands of families chose to replace their linoleum floors. In poor neighborhoods, the old linoleum was left in piles on the street. Young people, without access to playgrounds or dance classes, turned their parents' trash into dance floors and invented new moves like the windmill and the headspin to maximize its potential. Faced with our own resource constraints, educators need to find new platforms. What refuse could we be dancing on? And what are our new moves? Behind the mic, spray cans, turntables, and when it comes to their educations, students have brilliant ideas and instincts. Hip Hop Genius is not just about teachers using hip hop songs to get kids to succeed in traditional schools. It's about changing education to respect and build from young people's brilliance. It's about the incredible possibilities that occur when students are engaged, not as consumers, but as creators. We don't need to tweak the content inside existing traditional academic structures. We need to think outside the classroom and build institutions that are fundamentally more responsive to young people's interests and ingenuity. We need to create schools and school systems that not only teach hip hop, they are hip hop. Thank you. Thank you. So just so that you know, uh, what I care about passionately in terms of this work as um, you know, someone in a career change and, and now engaged in education and transforming the life of youth, I care most about opportunity youth and their re-engagement, young people who people have given up on, dropped through the cracks, equity and issues of of uh, racial and social justice. I, I really believe around in issues around alternative accountability. I believe people who do this work really need to have the kind of uh, proper assessment to, to, to assess the type of work they're doing in terms of how well they're doing it. But for the purpose of today, my focus is really around innovation and creativity and entrepreneurship. So, um, you know, we saw basically what's, what's there in that slide through uh, Sam's incredible piece around hip hop genius and, and focusing on our high schools. So for you today, I really, as CTE educators and, and people doing this work, I really want to build upon that creativity and innovation and have you understand, um, you know, the possibilities of young people uh, we still too often think about how we can um, fill up students with stuff as opposed to re what we release in them, which I think is, is critical. Um, the truth is many students like the ones that we serve have a lot of stuff to first come out of them before they're able to let anything in. And we just have to uh, appreciate that. And how can we do that in a positive and creative manner that can truly lead to a career and something purposeful. So if you could go to the next slide. Um, I'm going to now address this question. How do we prepare learners for jobs, problems that do not yet exist? I mean, everyone is asking that. Everyone's trying to think about that because we already know, we see it mentioned all the times that in 2020, 2030, we don't even know what kind of jobs young people are gonna have. The, the, the job positions haven't even been thought of yet. So the only thing we can really do in anticipation of that is, to, is how we help our students think creatively and think with innovation, how they become great communicators and collaborators and problem solvers. So I said I'm gonna show this more than talk about it and I'm going to sh um, bring my students into this space now. And it's basically three different um, projects that you're going to see. The first one is called 26 Seconds. 
So at our school, we have a professional state-of-the-art recording studio. And we also have professional uh, video production. But we also have a business of music and an and a enterprise called Another Level Records where our students actually operate and engage in the business aspects of what they create. Because we you know, always say we're not rhyming for the sake of riddling. That's a, that's a rap line. It's not about what them being on the stage and performing, although they do that and they do that extremely well. It's about them owning that creativity and producing it and, and, and tying it to messages that mean something, maybe just to them, but maybe to the community as well. So this first project, 26 Seconds, um, we engage with a lot of outside entities in that creation process with our students. So whether it's businesses, community-based organizations, foundations, governmental agencies, mom and pop shops, we want our students to understand what does it mean to produce at a high level, to meet deadlines, to meet the demands of a client. So the, um, our biggest client has been State Farm. And we did, had done a number of different projects with State Farm, and, and this one became our biggest. They asked our students to create a national campaign around the dropout rate. Every 26 seconds, someone drops out of school. Based on the success of other projects, they said, we're going to uh, give you guys this huge contract, fly you all over the country, give you media access, and we're also going to assign LeBron James as your co-partner, as a spokesperson. What an incredible opportunity for young people that most have forgotten. So for right now, I'm going to show you the culmination of that project, that 26th project, 26 second project with Domino, who dropped out of school as a parent and probably would not have been um, thought of in any way preparing themselves for the jobs that don't yet exist. So. Good evening and welcome to this great reception and to the Grad Nation Summit. Every 26 seconds, a young person drops out of high school, which means we're losing an entire generation of great potential. That's a million young people leaving our schools for our streets each year. That is economically unsustainable and is morally unacceptable. Please join me in welcoming the High School for Recording Arts. All of us. And keep America's promise to the promise of America our children. We sponsor this program called 26 Seconds. Tell me why business has to be involved in this. We want to make sure that our kids today are having an exposure to a learning environment that will give them the critical analytical skills, communication skills that they're going to need. After you hear about the statistic, after you see the people around you are trying to help, now it's all up to the students. It's up to us as the students to actually take an effort to, you know, go ahead and graduate high school. Guys, look at here. I'm LeBron James. Stay in school. Don't drop out. Go to Facebook, 26 seconds. What's hot? It's time that students know that we believe in them. Today we have a 26 second dropout prevention rally. We um, brought in High School of Recording Arts. The whole showcase. They were like, bam, this is what it is. You guys were out here doing this. You guys could do it too. I was actually going to be a dropout student. Um, I was dropping out of high school actually my freshman year. I just want these kids to understand like we're in high school too. If we can do it, so you can do this too. Well, I just basically wrote down um, like I've made bad choices all my life and no one ever noticed me do good until I made bad choices and now I'm doing great. People could follow my example, like my younger like siblings and stuff. Mm -hmm be a real good moral model because I don't want to be like, like just stop after high, high school and just lurk, lurk around the reservation all the time. That just keeps me motivated just to know that I can go off somewhere and be something great and then come back and help my own. Yeah. We can finally put our hands in the air. Wake just up. celebrate. Cause today is the good day that we graduate. Start here. You were at number 26. I know that has some meaning for you. Why? We have one young person in this country dropping out every 26 seconds. That's unacceptable. We have to challenge that status quo together. The D-League All-Star game this year, they're going to a 26-second clock. I want to get this out. I want, to, I want people to understand, um, you know, 
you know, how bad this is right now um, for you um, because there are a future. So any little ways I can help by like doing campaigns or doing uh, commercials or, or, or just saying, you know, I'm happy to be a part of it. This is my graduation. Thank you, thank you. So um, we're going to unpack these videos um, later because I think it's important to, for you to understand how we see it in terms of projects and competencies. But I just want to let you know, everything you saw in there was through the th thought leadership of our students. They designed the campaign. They designed the logo. The, the music that you heard, that was Domino singing with um, one of his other students' uh, tracks and created something that impacted our community on that high of a level with the Secretary of Education, Colin Powell, and others. But we have an opportunity now to have Domino himself unpack what he experienced and what he um, has been doing at the school through this project. So let's, let's watch that. More than 1.2 million students dropped out of high school last year. It works out to one every 26 seconds. It's a big, complicated problem. Fixing it will take teachers, administrators, students, parents, politicians, and business. Joining me now to talk about it, Ed Rust, CEO of State Farm, the insurance company, former West Virginia Governor Bob Wise, now president of the Alliance for Excellent Education, and, and Dominique Farrar, who almost dropped out of school twice but is still in school. Dominic, welcome to the program. Your Hi. friends call you Domino, right? Yes, they do, Domino. So tell me, you uh, went through this program 26 seconds, yes. and you thought about dropping out a couple of times, yes. but you stayed in. What, yes, I did. What did it mean to you? Why did you decide to stay in? Well, at first, when I was preparing to drop out at the Agricultural Food and Science Academy, I just wasn't interested in school. I wasn't interested in, in the, the traditional, how you say, just traditional right. academics. And um, when, I was, when I was enrolled in the high school for recording arts, I began to actually become more focused in academics and in graduating until things got rough with my daughter and whatnot, paying child support. Right. So, so you're 19 years old and yes, you're a dad. Yes, ma'am. So like many people who are considering dropout, yes. you are a grown-up and you're a kid at the same time. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. Um, what kept me in school was, it was random actually, I came to the school one day and one of the facilitators, he's like the big brother fa facilitator, right. Dario, he was talking about the 26 second campaign. And when he said every 26 seconds somebody drops out of school. And that was going to be you. Yeah, exactly. So it was like, kind of smacked me in the face. Like, I'm going to be, I want to be a statistic. I want to be, and plus being a recording artist, I want to, you know, set an example. I want to be someone that some, everybody looks up to. You know what I mean? What about an example for your daughter as well? Because oh, there's definitely. also this dropout cycle that's very difficult to right. break. You know, I mean, you are a role model. Right. And being a role model for my daughter is like, I don't want her to fall into a statistic that could grow. Like it could become every 10 seconds somebody drops out. You know what I mean? I don't want to, I don't want it to. So let me ask each of you, just quickly, uh, you know, what works? Is it mentorship? Is it money for college? Is it higher expectations from the people around you? What works to, what work to keep you in school? It's really self-motivation. Like after you hear, after you hear about the statistic, after you see the people around you are trying to help, now it's all up to the students. It's up to us as the students to actually take an effort to, you know, go ahead and graduate high school, become, be more, be you. Governor Wise, what, what works? Is, is it a little bit of everything? Does it it, it's, it's a little bit of everything, but let me just say it's targeting. We know as early as sixth grade what students are on the dropout track. We can intervene. And we also know as early as sixth grade. In the early as sixth grade. You can, you can tell from uh, drop in grades, you can tell from increased truancy, and you can tell from disciplinary what problems. What happens to those kids? What happens is they begin, they don't wake up one day and drop out. It's a process that's taking place over many years. We also know this. We know that about 8% of our high schools contribute half of all dropouts in the that's country. Right. We They're need Factories. The dropout factories. We need to target students as early as possible. We also need to target those schools that are producing the most dropouts. And Ed, what, from what you've seen in your affiliation with, with this or your sponsorship of this program, 26 Seconds, what works? You know, what, what is unique about the uh, 26 Seconds program is really, as Dominique was saying, it's a variety of ways of connecting with today's youth. Uh, be it uh, through Twitter, be it through Facebook, be it through other means of social networking or, or people uh, attending, uh, participating in school discussions, uh, getting communities involved in it. There's no one single factor. It's really getting uh, uh, our minds in a more holistic uh, approach 
around reaching out to our young people and helping them understand the relevance of an education, the importance long term, and giving them a variety of ways of how do they get engaged and get exposed to that. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Ed Rust from uh, State Farm, Governor Bob Wise, and also Dominic Farrar. Very yeah. nice to meet you. Best of luck to you right. and everything. What, we, what you saw there was really Domino being in a, in, a, in a frame of mind of thinking about his learning, thinking about his creation and sharing it um, to a national audience. The next video I want to show you is, is also part of the campaign where we engaged the whole aspect of jingle writing and creating songs that can appeal to other teenagers around issues related to causes that are important to whatever that client might be. So in this particular case, this was a campaign called Celebrate My Drive. Celebrate My Drive was all about uh, making aware new drivers around the country around the fact that driving is a great, great thing. You should be happy that you're doing it. But at the same time, it's very serious. So they wanted us to figure out how can we make that message appeal to young people all around the country. And interestingly enough, as I was looking at this, uh, this was a young lady from California. We're in Minnesota who, came, who followed what our students created with this L. And you'll see it from the song that um, this actually went viral, and this was the song that our students created. Just put your L's in the air, L, L's in the air. L's in the air, L, L's in the air, L's in the air. Like I said, for us, this is really about how do we engage young people's creativity and show them the entrepreneurial side of it as well. So we were, had a chance to um, join Junior Achievement. And Junior Achievement had this contest called Company of the Year. And what it was about was schools have students create companies that actually um, go into business. And they sell stocks and they sell products and then they compete with other schools around their products. When we first did it, I was thinking that, okay, well, we probably will just get some good experience from it. Our students had an incredible creative idea in terms of using our radio show and selling spots to the radio show to different local businesses. And from that selling the spots to local businesses, they would air those commercials on, on our radio show. So this was part of the campaign. You're gonna see a video that they created describing that business, and then you're gonna see them competing and um, we're going to go then into unpacking what these videos are all about. Man, I need some customers in here. Hey, are you listening? This could be you right now. If you're a business owner within the Metro, let HSRA and Junior Achievement leave your mark everywhere with a unique custom radio advertisement with cutting edge music created in our state of the art studios. This could be all yours for an incredible affordable price. For more information, contact Leave Your Mark Everywhere at lime at hsra.org. That's L-Y-M-E at H-S-R-A dot O-R-G. L-Y-M-E. I hope these guys can do something for me. Hi, you asked for Lime? We're gonna leave your mark everywhere. We give local businesses the opportunity to be recognized by making a 30 second jingle which airs on 96.3 now. It's all yours for $125, but hold up, I'm not done yet. After your 30 second jingle, we give you a two minute spotlight segment where we talk about your business. Are you interested? Yes. Okay, well, let's get the paperwork ready. Hey, we finished your jingle. How about you take a listen? Okay. 
So I went to the buy cuts just to see what they cheap. Told me sit down and cost 15 bucks. And when he got done, I said, hey, fresh cut. He told me no prop. He was doing his job. Hey, yo, yo, man, I want y'all to come get fresh to death at Divine Cuts, which is located at 1451 University Avenue, West in St. Paul, Minnesota. 55104 in the downstairs of Blessing Salon. Oh, hey, I just checked out your ad on uh, 96.3. I love it, hey man. I'm on my way up there right now to come get my hair cut right now. Man, I need help. You gonna fix me up? Man, I'm glad I found Lyle. Man, I'm glad I found you. Hey. So, yeah, thank you, thank you. So, like I said, I had very, um, what I thought were rational, low expectations doing it the first year that we would probably just get some experience. So we competed in the metro area. We won, which was like crazy. And then it was a regional Midwest competition. And we won that. So then we was flown to Washington, D.C. to compete against schools from all over the uh, United States and Canada. And when we got there, we began to realize, even though on the regional level, that our students, the ones who most have fallen through the cracks, most have had given up on, were competing now in this entrepreneurial contest against some of the most privileged young people in the country. And this was the result. And this video was produced by our students as well. The entrepreneurs really are the innovators and it is the job creation engine of our nation, has been for 200 years and will be for the next 200 years. It's going to be terrific if you take first place up here today. But if you don't, the sun is still going to come up tomorrow. You are still going to be successful. You have every opportunity. The students here have been involved with JA for uh, a school year. They're here competing against other kids around across America. These are the future entrepreneurs. Um, it's not just uh, putting a company together, but it's involvement with other kids across America. It's inspiring leaders. Um, some creativity, some inspiration, passion, perseverance. The people that are watching this video right now, you are the future leaders of America. America, America, America. It's all customizable and it's all what they wanted. We had a goal of selling 200 and we sold 214 total products. customize to our customer what their needs are and what they want. Uh, one of Best Buy initiatives is uh, how do we enable kids through technology and education. We have full lemonade over there for anybody who's thirsty. Thank you guys. Hi, we're from PIG Financial and our product is called Fortune Pay. It's a financial education tool aimed towards elementary school aged children. These students are absolutely amazing, and the companies and products that they've come up with will just blow your mind. We give you four 30-second jingles and a two-minute spotlight segment for $125. It's been a fantastic experience and uh, a great learning experience for myself, uh, as well as all my colleagues. Very good. Today was hard work. My feet are killing me. I've talked want to drink right all now day. Now it's my pleasure to announce the first place team who will each receive the Sweeney Student Achievement Award, which is a $1,000 scholarship. The first place team winner from St. Paul, Minnesota is Team One.
We have from our company, I'm the president of LIME. Um, we came from far away from St. Paul, Minnesota, so um, we just picked an advertisement company that we thought that we could go all the way with. So I'd like to say thank you to Junior Achievement. I'd like to say, to, uh, say thank you to the founder of the school, Mr. T.C. Ellis, his right-hand man, Tony Simmons. I'd like to say the person that gave us the courage all to, to get to Washington was Sarah Lofkins. I would like to thank Dario, the cameraman. He got to he got to keep he got to keep us straight. Got to keep us straight on the camera. And um, I, we have an amazing team. We have an amazing team. We they, we love each other. We have fun with each other. And thank you, Junior Achievement, for giving us his first place to work. Thank you. I really wanted that to play because um, I really wanted you to see, again, what the possibilities are when you believe in young people and you give them a chance to, to shine. So what do we see? How do we do projects at High School for Recording Arts? We could go to that next slide. So we know that young people crave to tell their own stories. I mean, look at what they do in terms of social media and the phenomena around that. Um, their culture. They want to express that, and who's going to tell their stories is really the question. And if we don't tr train and teach our young people to tell their stories, someone else will. So for us, you know, when we think about pathways and we think about those videos you watch, you know, organic projects is really about creating something that is important and intrinsic to what who our young people are, with authentic ends, real world ends, is outside of the building. So they access an interdisciplinary mastery list to award credits. I mean, it's hard to see what one particular discipline is happening in these various experiences. They're all over the place. It's just like life. It's just like the kind of work world that they're going to enter. And determining mastery by students um, Presetting rubric and expectations in collaboration with their teachers or validators, and checking out the process with self grading and validator assessment. So, for us, um, when we asked the question, and you could go to the next slide. Oh, okay, I forgot I stuck that one in there. Okay, <laughs> no. next one. You know, again, we're seeing much of what I just uh, discussed. So first it was about them expressing themselves. And then it was uh, them realizing that they could tell other people their stories and to their peers and people outside of their age groups. So, you know, for us, we believe that um, pe young people don't see themselves today just in terms of what they do. I mean, there was a time period where we kind of represented ourselves, you know, in terms of our career and such. It's far more intrinsic. It's far more about them representing their values and, and their identity as an integral part of what they're creating and what they're doing. And we believe by the, having these authentic projects, that is actually being realized. And then it, from that, you become able to really tap into community and really have an impact on what is happening in the community. So the best part of this is what develops in them. And, and that's, if we go to the next slide, in terms of the competencies. So for us, as we think about moving from skills to competencies, we're looking at this circular, interconnected means of how our students are gaining this kind of abilities, the mindsets that they're going to need in the 21st century economy with jobs that don't yet exist. So we begin to, we, we, we separate it. I mean, STEAM, everybody knows what that is, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. It's just extremely important in terms of our students and in all of those videos you saw um, numerous examples of how that is represented. But the arts part, the arts part is really that inner part, that creative part, that part that is not just about playing an instrument, it's about 
unleashing who they are. When I talk about them being more than just a, a job, it's about them. And then humanities and community and that connectedness and that, that sense that it has a purpose. Um, Self-actualization and purpose. You know, them seeing themselves in that space, understanding that they're capable of doing anything and allowing them to realize it now. Now. Not just when they go to college or graduate. Right now, the technology is there now. The opportunities are there now. The, the opportunity to build community partnerships and relationships like we demonstrated exists now. And then last, the communication, leadership, and entrepreneurialism. Um, you, only, you, you get that through the practice. You get that through going through the work and, and, and having that feedback in terms of your presentation and how you're doing. Um, imagine a domino being flown to New York to be on CNN alongside the CEO of State Farm and the governor of West Virginia and having to extemporaneously talk in that moment before millions and millions of people. We, those are the kind of opportunities we could have now. Next slide. We begin to see how this is unpacked. How do these projects showcase interdisciplinary competency? And just, just take note of it and realize that as we're doing the evaluation, as we're validating these, that's what we're looking at. That's what we're assessing. And if you, after this session, if you want to kind of think through some of these videos you saw, think about what were the examples of those competencies listed there. So, um, We need to challenge our students as, as authentic learners with experiences that makes it possible for them to demonstrate what they know inside the classroom and outside. And why is that? Because they are already global. They're already doing this. They're already in that space. They want to know if you're going to join them. They want to know if you're you know, ready and to take the risk and do the hard work and make the connections in, outside of the building and, and do the things that's, that's important for them. They're actually wondering if you believe in them. Because they, because they are already global, they are, they, they also, they're wired, they're interconnected, and when you stifle that, they will placate and ignore you or reject you. So creativity and innovation in many forms is to get our young people to tap into their peculiar bent of genius, as Plato said. That's what it's really about. It's about recognizing the genius of every single student. So um, let's catch up to them. Let's trust them. And I want to conclude by showing um, the most recent example of an incredible young lady who's going through a lot, who has done everything that I just was describing in terms of, of realizing who she is and bringing that into her ideas around a project that was before uh, validators within her community and that experience being something that's gonna be with her for the rest of her life. So this event is really about enabling the future entrepreneurs of tomorrow. We've asked these young people to come to the table with an idea around how to improve health and wellness in their schools. These kids are experiencing issues of health and wellness in their schools. It's happening in every city. And when you're asking someone to tap into that entrepreneurial mindset and really think about creative ways to solve problems, what anyone will do is think about their world. Over 50% of our students are dealing with homelessness and independent living, which means we are extremely stressed out.
And my solution to decrease our stress levels is have meditation be involved in our advisory class. What I would use your money for is mats, our music boxes, and also candles and art. Wake Up is my big idea project, and I would like to keep peace in our minds. So what, what gave you the idea for this? Well, I personally deal with homelessness, and so what has helped me you know, be in class and be attentive is meditation and yoga, and just going down with myself and thinking about what I can do to improve, and so meditation helps me with that. So it helps you kind of distance yourself from those issues so you can concentrate yeah. on school, is that the So idea? I'm not always thinking about what's my next meal, where am I gonna get these clothes, how am I gonna survive in the streets? I'm thinking about what's in front of me instead of thinking about after. So that was Audrey, an um, incredible young lady, and um, just a, a great example of, of what we've been talking about. I do want to mention this book, The Tanning of America. Um, it's written by Steve Stout. It's a great example of what we do at the high school for recording arts in terms of understanding youth culture and being able to have young people represent that culture in a way that is powerful and meaningful to both businesses, community-based organizations, you know, various um, entities. And then the next slide is simply Audrey again, and the, the final slide is Audrey with that $1,000 check to the High School for Recording Arts to carry forth her idea for health and wellness. I wanna end with her and that big, beautiful smile, and thank you guys so, so much for this opportunity to share their story with you. Is Audrey homeless with a family or by herself? Um, you know, uh, um, with respect to Audrey, you know, I, I don't want to get too much into her situation, but she self reveals she's homeless. Um, she has a difficult situation in terms of her family. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. Um, I got a question for you over here. Yes. Um, I run a similar social enterprise with my students. Um, one of the issues that I have, and I'm doing mine through the YMCA um, Youth Institute, and um, one of the issues my, my Y is having, my organization having, is, is paying students. Do you guys, as an yes. enterprise, pay your students? How are you getting around the Fair Labor Act laws, and, and are you taking them on as employees, right, and, right. and dealing with minors as employees, or are you waiting until they're 18? Sure, sure. Great question. Um, we do pay our, our students. We believe it's extremely important to do that. Um, and we usually, you know, we, one of the good things about having a law background is being able to make sure we cover all those things. Um, but uh, like I said, not only we do get grants, we also get contracts. And we're always insistent with our um, potential clients that we want to compensate our students because one, this is their creativity. And we know that they need it. And, um, and we're able to garner some significant resources to support that. But in addition to actually paying them, um, for me, the most important thing is their intellectual property rights. All of our students own what they create. We, we help them navigate first to learn about copyright law and to file their copyright forms. And when we engaged with State Farm, for the first time ever in State Farm's history, um, we were able to license our students' content. But at the end of the contract, I was able to get State Farm to revert back to our students full rights and ownership of what they created for them. They had never done that before. Usually they do a work for hire, you're familiar with that concept. You know, if you're gonna work, do something for a major corporation, they don't wanna know that you exist. You know, you create for them, they give you something, and it, they own it forever. Um, because they became a good partner, um, they understood the importance of that. So yes, that, that's something we believe in strongly, and we believe in um, protecting and representing our students so that they could take advantage of, of their creativity. Um, I've got a question. Um, so teachers often replicate the sort of 
learning experiences. Where are, that, where are you? Where are you? Oh, sorry, right okay, there. there you are. Sorry. Um, <laughs> teachers often replicate the learning experiences that they experienced as students growing up. How can we ensure that our students coming through innovative teaching models are also bringing those expectations for education into the world, either as, as teachers or ensuring that those sort of pedagogies uh, blossom. So bringing it into the world. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think you have to demonstrate. I think you have to show stakeholders what young people are capable of doing. Like I said, I could have come here today and I could have talked about this stuff. There's nothing more powerful than seeing what young people are capable of creating and producing as an affirmation to us doing things outside of the traditional way. Now, I, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, because we're a school that engaged young people who've dropped out, we've had some issues sometimes around graduation rates. You would think that a school that's engaging young people who drop out wouldn't have issues around four-year on-time graduation rates because how well, how are we gonna do that if they've already dropped out? We're trying to re-engage them. So, but we had some you know, incredible challenges in Minnesota for a short while. Um, all of the clients that we work with, major corporations and these foundations, they came to our defense. They went to the legislature, they went to the Department of Education, um, our parents. They're the ones who are gonna be the biggest cheerleaders and biggest defenders of doing things in these new innovative ways when they become a part of it and they see it and they understand how important it is. Did I answer your question? Okay. Hi there, good morning. Hi. My name's June. And Hi, June. I was just really interested in whether the materials you talked about about protecting intellectual property mm -hmm. is available for those of us who are interested in, in doing more with young people and creativity and protecting yes. their rights and how to teach that. Yep. Download PA and SA forms, <laughs> Google copyright forms, they're free. Um, and you can f fill them out and, and, um, and, and do that. I, I encourage everyone to have young people understand. You, you know, this is a sharing economy. And a lot of young people today, and it's good, I understand it. You know, they're doing things in a space oftentimes where they're not taking care of that side of the business. And um, like I said, I think there's some good sides to that. Some of the collaboration opportunities that that creates is incredible. But once they begin to rise up and, and it begins, begins to become a little more serious and they want to think about taking care of themselves and their families with their creativity, them understanding that part, you know, usually the light goes off right away like, well, someone just took my beat or my music or this and that. And, and um, so it's never too early for them to understand and appreciate that even as they're sharing and giving it away for free, just so that um, when it becomes important for them, um, they, they, they know how to do it. Good morning, my name is Vince yes. Gonzalez and my, my comment is yesterday we talked about the word passion. Yes. We have a lot of phenomenal students throughout the states all over the nation. But we can't forget that the adults who have passion, like, like you, it goes right down to those students. Their success is based on all of us in this room that have passion. Yes. So continue that. I want to applaud you. You can give them a round of applause. Thank you so much for your passion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. And, and when you turn on students like we try to do, it's just, it's going back and forth. You know, you, you'll get that from them. You, you, the pride that you feel and what you see that they're capable of doing just makes, makes your work that more meaningful. Mm. Yes. Hi, Tony. Thanks. Hi. Um, my question is kind of specifically about in the, in the music field, because I also teach a recording arts right. program. And how do, you, how do you navigate this? You know, our frame of reference, I know mine in terms of the music industry is 20... 30 years old, and my, my experience is going to Tower Records and getting the newest CDs. These kids are growing up in a completely different world and industry, and so my question is, is more how do you adapt 
what you teach to their environment and this new, you know, it's, it's a whole new paradigm in, in the music industry. I turn it around. I'm, yeah. I'm trying to keep up. I'm, you know, um, I'm not sure what we teach. I think in this very real sense, they're teaching us and we're guiding them. They're going for... Like I said, they're doing this stuff now anyway. The real critical piece that's missing is responsible, caring, adult guidance. You have incredible experience. Everything you said about what you, you know, were doing since the Tower Record days, I remember those, uh, is, is important. But if you put that in front, you're already losing them. If you put what they're doing in front and you're, and you're watching over it and, and when, they, when they get a roadblock or they have a question or you see an opportunity to bring in your experience, that's when I think it becomes most powerful. And that's when you keep their attention and they begin to see your relevance in terms of what they're trying to do. You know, uh, Steve Jobs said once that... Um, our generation, we were consumers. We were used to going to the Tower Records to buy what's um, out there, someone created. Young people today, he said, are producers. It's a, it's a fundamental difference. They're, they're seeing um, not what somebody else has done as the driving force of their engagement for pleasure, entertainment, they're, they want to, they're doing it themselves and, and they're collaborating with others and they're creating and it's, it's, it's kind of part of that, you know, um, I mean, there's some other interesting aspects to it, but I think that's a real fundamental understanding that young people today are producers as opposed to consumers. Do your students do internships, and if so, how do they do that? You know, um, there's some great schools that uh, focus around internships, mentorships outside of the building, and we do some of that. But we like to think of ourselves as an uh, enterprise within our school. We are the business. When our students walk into our space, if you have, ever have a chance to come in, it, look, it looks like high tech. It looks like a business, though. You know, you got the studios, the video production area, the business area, the arts, the different things. Young people go in to work, to create, to produce. So we have internships within the various jobs and responsibilities within the school as part of the school day. And the other side of that that I don't mind revealing to you is that Many of our students who come from different challenging situations and still are developing their coping skills and, and habits around work, it's a great place to start when you're, when you're doing that in a, in a supportive environment. So we're getting students who have great energy and creativity, but you know, learning about things in terms of you know, etiquette and collaborating with each other, the fact that we have that enterprise going on in the school, we're able to help them and guide them in ways that when that opportunity comes because, say, uh, um, business down the street now wants them to come in and do a mentorship internship, they they've, they've really have sharpened themselves, and they're really ready for that, and they, and they succeed, at a, I believe, at a much higher level. Hi, um, my question is kind of related to, to that a little bit. Um, where do your students wind up working? Like, do a lot of them stay in the arts with, after they graduate, or do they, are they out in the community in different kinds of jobs? Man, they're doing everything. Um, it, it always amazes me, you know, what type of, um, how, how my students are doing. It really does affirm that they're creating opportunities for themselves in a community oftentimes that doesn't have many jobs. So I have a number of students who 
continue to support themselves around music. Um, some signed to major recording labels, some with um, um, their own studios and doing work with major corporations and small businesses. Many who just collaborate on a community level and just you know hustle hard and, and have shows and do other things. But the majority of my students are just, you know, our aim is not to create that. Our aim is that our students become lifelong learners, that they become producers, that they are able to um, take care of themselves and their family in a way that they feel, you know, proud about. Hi. Uh, bienvenidos. Welcome to San Diego. Yes. Um, <clears throat> to everybody who's, who's not from our beautiful city. Um, can you speak a little bit more about the curriculum integration and especially the components of both the beat, so the musical component, and the, the business, the entrepreneurial, and how that is integrated and included in the core content? Um, and if you could also speak a little bit about your teaching staff um, and the community partnerships both that you started with and now have. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we're project-based at our core, but we also use multiple strategies. And what I mean by that is that we still do um, um, some things in classes, workshops. We have um, um, blended learning. Um, so a student comes in and every student in our school has a personal learning plan. Every student has a personal learning plan. And every student has an advisor. Um, because we have students who um, um, come to us having um, the, the traditional system didn't work out well for them and they have a lot of other issues going on, our advisors are all uh, people steeped around youth development. They're not content teachers, but we are content advisors, are licensed teachers, but we still call them advisors. So we have this, you know, two sides of, uh, our student advisors and then our content advisors. So a student has a personal learning plan they created with their advisor and from that plan they're going to be doing, um, seeing their credits that they need to earn, understanding the state standards they need to meet, and then creating projects or a mix of classes, blended learning, or maybe even post-secondary educational options where they could access a class at a college. So it's very much kind of that mix, and every student looks different. But if they're doing a project, it's pretty much like I described up there in terms of that project process. Um, they're creating outlines, they're, they're doing a the research, they're setting deadlines, they're accessing um, community um, um, experts or validators who's going to be able to uh, assign a credit, if you will, and we, we work very intentionally with our community partners for them to understand what does it mean to be a community validator. Um, the fact that we are accessing them within our, our space to help our content advisors, our licensed teachers, um, work collaboratively with them to take that validation from that community person to the level where that content advisor is able to provide credit for them based on the experience and based on what um, the student has demonstrated that they have learned or mastered. Did I hit all the points? I, I think so. Okay, okay, okay. Do we have more questions? All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Tony Simmons, High School for the Recording Arts. Thank you.